tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Thanks for waiting out to meet me through the Cotton Mouse and the Gator Gar and the Majestic Bunyip. It's a wonder you keep showing up. One day you're going to lose a leg. Settle down, Chester. You just had a leg for lunch. I swear, these kids eat me out of house and home. Come on in, friend. Mm. Oh, that's better. Thanks, Pimpata, for sending the cigarettes. Glad you enjoyed the shout-out last week. Nothing like a good smoke to start the show. Mm. Oh, son of a bitch! Oh. Mm. Damn Italian cigarettes. Uh, guess I'll just stick to these for now. Anyway, tonight we're joined by a Drew Blood regular. A man whose ordinary daydreams are most people's nightmares. A man who could scare your pants off no matter how tight you cinch your belt. A man whose entire body is scarred by pulsating glowing red sigils. That's right, it's Ryan Harville. I made up the part about the sigils, but you get the idea. <sighs> so smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, a word from the big shots upstairs. Well, since my voice is giving me so much trouble right now, you're just going to have to get this in a normal voice. This is Season 1, Episode 22 of Drew Blood. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. To enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. And we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Our first story begins in the Houston hospital where all hell is about to break loose. Or maybe it already has. From author Ryan Harville, I give you Dawn Over Houston. A woman's voice floated from the speakers overhead. Dr. Harper, please report to Laboratory 3. Dr. Harper, please report to Laboratory 3. The word please almost amused him, like they were asking, like he had a choice. Harper slowly sat up on the couch in the doctor's lounge and pulled his gaze from the useless TV, whose only function seemed to be showing no signal on the screen in a baleful blue. The clock on the wall showed a quarter after four in the morning. Harper sighed and stood, stretching his back until he felt a series of satisfying pops. He ran his hand over the front pocket of his pants, checking for his cell phone that wasn't there. He grimaced, remembering they had confiscated it before he boarded the plane. His footsteps echoed through the empty corridor. It was early, but he still expected to run across an overworked resident running their rounds, or a custodian taking the opportunity to work in peace. The silence made him afraid, and that's what he hated most of all. Fear could be useful, he thought. It could be a warning, but mostly it was an annoyance. The hall opened up into Methodist Willowbrook Hospital's lobby, where two armed guards eyed him as he approached. The fluorescent lights reflected off their shiny black helmets and polished boots. Identification, please, the one on the left said, holding out his hand. He looked all of 19 years old with a round, soft face. Harper kept walking. I'm about to be late. Now, if you don't mind... The boy placed his hand on Harper's chest. ID. Now, please. The boy's partner tensed and the barrel of his rifle rose. Not much, but enough for Harper to notice. Harper stepped back. Keep your hands off me. Does your mother know you're out this late, asshole? 
Stand down, Evans, a voice said from the lobby. A man rose from one of the love seats and approached them. The man's helmet dangled from a clip on his body armor, clicking against the rifle slung across his chest. Where the two guards were dressed in black tactical gear, the man was in military fatigues. Army or Marines, Harper guessed, but didn't care either way. The man stepped between the guards. I'm Staff Sergeant James, NCO in charge of these two gentlemen tonight. And you are? Harper did his best to keep his annoyance from showing on his face. I'm Dr. Keith Harper, and I'm late for a very important meeting. I'm expected- Dr. Harper. Keith. Can I call you Keith? Before Harper could tell James that he could not, in fact, use his first name, the man had taken hold of his arm and led him a few feet away from the other guards. Listen, Keith. We're not friends. You don't get to- As I was saying, Keith, you're on your way to a meeting, right? Yes. I told you- You have a job to do. James gestured to the guards. These boys have a job to do, too. Their job is to guard this entrance. So, why don't you let them do their job so you can go do yours? Harper shook with anger, his fists clenched at his sides. Look, I've been dragged halfway across the country. I'm exhausted, and I'm in no mood for this. Now, if you will excuse me... I don't. What? I don't excuse you. You cannot detain me here. James smiled. And that is one of the many ways you are wrong, Doctor. I can detain you. See, this is my lobby. No one goes through my lobby without me saying so. Now, show your ID to those nice fellows there, and you can be on your way. It's that easy. Fine, Harper growled. You want to act like we're under martial law? Go ahead, but you'll hear about this later. <laughs> James's laugh filled the empty lobby. See, Doc, <laughs> I told you, so many ways to be wrong. If you'd taken two seconds to wonder why Army personnel were in charge of a couple of local SWAT guys, you might have figured it out for yourself. As of midnight, you are under martial law. Harper's mouth had gone dry. That's impossible. You want to see something impossible? When you get up to the third floor, take a look out the window. Now, flash your ID to the guards, get the fuck out of my lobby, and have a nice day. Harper reached his shaky hand into his coat pocket and slowly withdrew his ID badge. The guard glanced at it. Thank you, doctor. You may proceed. Harper's lips twitched, straining to hold back a stinging remark. James's smile was gone. He simply cocked his head to the side away from the hall. His face burning, Harper brushed past the guards and into the lobby. Within a few strides, he passed a tall bronze statue of Jesus, his hand on a kneeling woman. A lot of help you were, he spat at the statue. He reached the elevator and stabbed his finger at the button. The door slid open and he stepped inside. Harper slammed his fist against the wood paneling. Who the fuck does he think he is? He cried. Stupid fucking pseudo-alpha males and their guns. Dr. Harper. The woman's voice said through a speaker above his head, but this time she was a little less pleasant. Please report to Laboratory 3, Dr. Harper. Please report to I'm Laboratory coming, goddammit, he said, punching the button for the third floor. The elevator lurched upward. Harper closed his eyes and tried to slow his breathing, willing himself to calm down. This is why he hated fear, because it turned him into a goddamn mess. He could feel his pulse in his neck and loathe the hammer and thump of it. By the time the doors opened onto the third floor, he had mostly composed himself. He stepped quickly out into the hall, telling himself his fast stride was purposeful and not panicked. Dr. Granger stood outside the stainless steel double doors that led into Lab 3, along with some woman he didn't know. She was probably mid-fifties and her silver hair brushed the shoulders of her navy suit. Harper forced himself to smile as he approached. I apologize for being late. I had a little run-in with the guards. Granger cleared his throat, beads of sweat running from the top of his bald head. <clears throat> Dr. Harper, this is Dr. Ann Schneider, deputy director of the CDC. She's flown in from Atlanta to, uh, observe. Dr. Harper, 
It's a pleasure to meet you, Schneider said, holding out her hand. Harper shook it. You as well, Deputy Director. I appreciate you flying in on such short notice, but your expertise may help to understand what's going on here. It might, Harper said. If I had any idea what was going on here, I was pulled away from dinner by some general who put me on a plane and said it was a matter of national security. I apologize ahead of time if I seem a little out of sorts. Of course, Schneider said. I had a very similar experience myself, and here we are. Remind me, Doctor, what is it you specialize in? Harper wanted to sigh, but suppressed the urge. Hadn't she just mentioned his expertise? Cell biology and physiology. Specifically, physiological bone remodeling. She nodded, but her eyes seemed far away. That sounds fascinating. Ah, uh, yes, I think so at least, Harper said. So, what's this about? I mean, obviously, it's about whatever is going on in Houston, but I don't know what it has to do with me. Granger pushed open one of the doors. Please, come in and we can talk about it privately. Harper followed them in. The lab was split into two sections. One side was filled with various monitors beeping at intervals, and two rows of mismatched chairs that Harper was fairly sure were dragged in just for this purpose. He walked over to the large window that separated their side of the room from the other and rapped gently on the glass. A mint green curtain obfuscated the view, only showing the smeared shadows of people at work. Uh, what's this lab used for? He said, turning back to Granger. Its intended use is to treat patients with highly communicable diseases, but in the past 11 years I've been at this hospital, we've never had to use it, thank God. So, whoever is in there is contagious? Schneider hushed Granger with a look. The truth is, we don't know, she said. At this point, we don't know how it spreads, or even what it is. We just know what happens to the infected. Harper didn't like the tone of her voice. There was something behind it. Fear? Definitely. But he thought he heard excitement there as well. And just what is it that happens? Harper said, not entirely sure he wanted the answer. Granger stepped past him and thumbed the button on a nearby intercom. This is Dr. Granger. Open the curtain. One of the shadows moved behind the veil and the curtain was drawn back. A man lay on a bed in the middle of the room. The bright white of the light shone down on his sweaty, jaundiced skin. His chest heaved with every ragged breath he managed to draw in past the heavy leather restraints that secured him to the bed. This is Matthew Pastor, Granger said. He was a few blocks away from Ground Zero. He somehow managed to make it to his truck and drove away from downtown. They stopped him as he tried to ram through a barricade the National Guard had stood up on Highway 45. They didn't know what to do with him, so they brought him here. Wait. Ground Zero, Harper said. Uh, last I heard, there was some rioting going on or something. What the hell happened? Terrorists? Granger and Schneider exchanged a look. On the other side of the glass, the sallow man bucked against his restraints and screamed. Harper felt every hair on the back of his neck stand up. What is this, Granger? What has he got? Soon, Schneider said. I'll tell you what we know. But now we just need you to observe. Granger keyed the intercom once more. Make sure the cameras are rolling, then get out of there. There was a flurry of movement as the masked doctors in the other room did their last minute checks and gathered their instruments. And in less than a minute, the room was empty save for Matthew Pastor. The doors opened on their side of the glass and the doctors came spilling into the room talking fast and grabbing up nearby seats. Granger gently led Harper away from the glass. They both stood against the wall and waited. Pastor screamed again and threw himself against the straps. Harper watched as the man struggled, his veins showing green beneath his yellow skin, his breathing quickening as he began to hyperventilate. Very soon now, Granger whispered. The bed shook with Pastor's wild movements, and suddenly there was a snap as loud as a gunshot as one of the leather straps holding Pastor's wrist gave way. 
He quickly pivoted and dug his fingers beneath the strap on his opposite wrist and pulled, tearing away the restraint and flinging it across the room. Harper grabbed Granger by the arm. Do something for Christ's sake. Granger only shook his head weakly. Nothing we can do now. Pastor flexed his chest and the strap there snapped like an overstretched rubber band. He sat up and made quick work of the ankle restraints. He rolled from the bed, clutching his head and crying out. Help me! I got someone out! His words were cut short as he slammed his head against the floor. Blood fanned out from his split scalp. Pastor raised his head and looked to the window. Harper stood transfixed. Pastor nodded to no one, his face drawn and bloody. He placed both hands flat against the floor, raised his head high and slammed it forward once again. The sound of the man's skull cracking was much louder than Harper would have imagined. He'd cut into skulls for research purposes, yes, but had never witnessed something like this. This was primal. Dazed, Pastor stood on wobbling legs and fell against the window. He rested there, his breath sending patterns of fog across the glass. The wound on his forehead was red, and his cracked skull showed through it, shockingly white. Harper had had enough. He was done watching this man torture himself while everyone stood around and... There! There! Granger said breathlessly. Look there, Harper! Harper didn't want to, but he did. The crack in the man's skull began to grow as flakes of bone spread out like a blooming flower. Protrusions and knobs snaked from between the petals, hardening in front of the man's face like malformed horns. That is impossible, Harper said, his eyes dry and unblinking. That kind of growth is impossible. Pastor turned his head towards Harper's voice his new horns digging furrows into the glass with a screech. The jaundice had spread from the corners of the man's eyes and into the blue irises, staining them a sickly green. You're right, Dr. Harper, Schneider said, seeming to appear out of nowhere at his side. It shouldn't be possible, but it is. And that's where you come in. Harper shook his head, his thoughts a jumbled mess. I have got to, if you'll excuse me. He shouldered past them and shoved the doors open. The air in the hall was blessedly cooler than in the observation room and he breathed it in greedily. Harper slowly paced the floor, trying not to think about what he had just witnessed, but the crooked points of bone wouldn't leave his mind. Get it together, he said, rubbing his hands over his face. It's science. It's new, but it's all science. You can figure it out. Just have to calm down and... He trailed off as he looked to the window at the end of the hall, the words of the sergeant downstairs running through his head. You want to see something impossible? When you get up to the third floor, take a look out the window. And that's what Harper did. The early morning sunlight was a serene mixture of orange and pink. It bathed the cars in the lot below and lit up the dew on the leaves of the trees just to the south. It was a beautiful Texas morning, a different kind of sunrise than he was used to in Chicago, where the light had to find its way through the skyscrapers first. Dr. Granger's footsteps clicked towards him, but he barely noticed, just continued to stare. In the distance was a bruise on the horizon, a massive spot of livid purple and diseased green. What is that? Harper said as much to himself as Granger. That, Granger said, is downtown Houston. Is it? Harper began, trying to find words to fit. Is it radiation? Or clouds? Both? Why is it just hanging there? It's not clouds, Granger said. And it's not just hanging there. It's spreading from the ground up, like a, a bubble or something. Military guys are calling it the scab. Why? Because the uppermost parts of it are hardening, like a crust. Still, no one knows what it is or where it's coming from. Harper rubbed his temples, then ran his hands through his hair, exhaling loudly. 
And what exactly does that thing out there have to do with the young man in the lab growing horns at an alarming rate? Granger sighed and looked back to the window. Anyone who's been caught in the scab has come out like poor Matthew Pastor. Strong, angry, and out of control. Hell-bent on causing trauma to himself to break his bones, Harper interrupted. That's it, isn't it? The bone must be broken for new growth to occur. It triggers some sort of mutation or... Shit, I don't know, but it feels right. You may be right, Harper, but we just don't have more info to... The crash of broken glass echoed through the hall, followed by cries and screams. One of the masked doctors ran from the lab, slamming the door behind him. He's broken containment! Coke! The door buckled in the middle and flew free of its hinges, slamming into the doctor and sending him sprawling to the opposite wall as Matthew Pastor erupted through the doorway. The doctor raised both hands in a warden gesture before Pastor reached between them and grabbed the doctor by the head, covering his face. Please, the doctor said, his voice muffled by Pastor's palm. Please don't. Pastor squeezed the muscles of his forearm flexing hard enough to split the yellowing skin. Harper could hear the man's skull cracking, the sound like faraway gunshots. Blood ran from his eyes and soaked into his mask. Harper's shock stupor was broken by Granger grabbing his shoulder. Come on, we have to help him. Harper shook his head slowly. He felt like he was waking up from a deep sleep as his brain fog dissipated and his muscles prepared to fire. He slung Granger's hand away from him. He's dead already, Harper said. And we will be too if we don't get out of here now. Granger sneered at him. Coward, he said and rushed toward Pastor. Harper didn't bother with a retort and instead sprinted for the stairs, taking them two at a time, pushing the fear of falling out of his head. He was nearly to the first floor when he heard Granger's screams descend eerily through the stairwell. He flung the stairwell door open wide and stopped himself before he ran headlong into Staff Sergeant James. Well, if it isn't Keith, your very important meeting is already over. Must not have been. He's coming, Harper said between pants of heavy breathing. You've got to stop him. He's killed at least two people, maybe more. I don't know. Staff Sergeant James squinted at him suspiciously. What the hell are you on about? Before he could reply, thudding footsteps like hoofbeats thundered in the stairwell. Oh, God. Oh, God, you've got to stop him, Harper cried, grabbing James by his body armor. James shoved him, and Harper fell back, pinwheeling his arms to no avail. He struck a low chair-side table and cried out as he hit the ground. Don't you ever touch me, James spat. Fucking civvies, thinking you've got the run of everything. Coddled and spoiled. James was still ranting, but Harper didn't hear him. He was fixated on Pastor's leering yellow face as it appeared over the staff sergeant's shoulder. Pastor grabbed the man and spun him around. What the fuck? Was all James managed to utter before Pastor delivered a headbutt hard enough to cave in the man's face. Hot blood fell over Harper and he screamed, staring down at the blood on his hands and his pants. Pastor dropped the man to the ground unceremoniously. The sharp bones protruding from his forehead were caked with gore. His expression changed, suddenly a mask of confusion, then of understanding. Uh, you're a doctor, right? Pastor said. Please, you have to help me. It's like there's something in my bones that wants out, and I can't stop it. It just keeps pushing and pushing, and it wants you all dead, and I can't stop it. I'm losing me, do you understand? I don't know how much more time I'll be in here, in my head, because it won't stop. Oh God, help me, help me. 
A cacophony of cries and gunfire erupted in the lobby. The young SWAT guys Harper had run into earlier had opened fire, and Pastor jerked spasmatically with the impact of each bullet. Pastor fell. Harper should have been grateful, but instead he was horrified as he watched new white blood slick bone emerge from the man's wounds. The protrusions met and knitted together until they were flat plates of bone against his skin. He's armoring himself, Harper thought. Jesus Christ, help us. Pastor rose with a growl and sped towards his attacker, loping magnificently like a beast after prey, like he'd been doing it his whole life, like he was a different species evolved perfectly to have this form. Harper already knew how this was going to play out and wasted no time finding his footing and running for the door. The Texas morning was already too warm for him, but he savored every breath of fresh air as he ran across the parking lot, finally collapsing onto the manicured grass at the lot's edge. He stared up at the sky, his chest rising and falling, his hands shaking. It wasn't until then he noticed that the morning wasn't silent. Sirens seemed to come from everywhere, punctuated by random bursts of noise from car horns. Faint screams were carried to his ears from the slight morning breeze. From somewhere came the god-awful bang of two vehicles colliding. Finally, there came another sound. A screech that drowned everything else out. Two jets screamed through the sky above him. He didn't know what kind they were. He didn't know shit about jets. But he had seen enough movies to recognize the sound of missiles being unleashed. The telltale whoosh of their ignition. The shriek of their flight. Towards millions of people. Towards Houston. Harper didn't rise. He continued to stare into the blue, preferring to hear the end of the world rather than witness it with his own eyes. And that was Dawn Over Houston by Ryan Harville. A good reminder to treat your bone spurs before they become a problem. Also, careful not to pick your scabs. You never know what's underneath. If you just can't help it though, search Amazon for Red Sun Magazine number 5, published by No Sell Out Productions, where the next part of this story is published. A little about the author. Ryan Harville writes horror stories centered around the strange states that are buckled beneath the Bible Belt. He has had stories featured in anthologies, magazines, and podcasts. He currently writes exclusively for the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Network and is a proud member of the Horror Writers Association. Ryan would also like you to know that the easiest way to test if one of your loved ones is actually an evil doppelganger is to check their pantry. If you see unfrosted Pop-Tarts, take immediate action. Use violence if necessary. For more info, please follow him on Twitter at Ryan Harville Writes or visit his website at RyanHarvilleWriting.com. For more Drew Blood, Ryan Harville collaborations, you can check out my playlist on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and past episodes of this program. And while you're checking those out, Please subscribe to this show wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a five-star review, would you? Every download and review in podcast land helps boost me up in the rankings, and I truly appreciate it. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get 227 Vietnamese dongs per word. And that's currency, just so you know, perverts. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week.
So grab yourself a drink for the road. And here, take these cigarettes with you. A little explosive for my tastes. And tonight, I'd like to recognize another member of our illustrious YouTube community, Luisa D'Angelo. Thanks for hanging around Casa de Blood with us. Always a kind word and nary a complaint about me blowing all this smoke in your face. Stay off the smokes. Trust me, your lungs and your cats appreciate it. Above all, keep away from those Pimpazza cigarettes. Take it from a man who just lost his mustache. Thanks for being there, Louisa. We appreciate you. Now go fuck yourself. <laughs> Good night, y'all.